And it's amazing that, that the closer we get to God, the closer he gets to us and the more he guides our life. All right, 1 John, 1 John chapter 2, verse by verse through 1 John, and we started this a long time ago doing an introduction to who John was and then uh, jumped into this letter that John has written. It's a letter to uh, the church of Ephesus, but it's also the, there's, a, there's a regional of churches that are there that are receiving it. It's also for us. And it's interesting what he zeroes in on in this letter. And we'll look at it today. Father, I praise you. Lord, we love you. Thank you for your faithfulness and your love, Lord. I thank you, Lord, for the family as we gather together in your name, Lord. Longing for that day that finally we get to run into your arms to see you face to face, Lord. We long for that day. But until that day, Lord, thank you for being Emmanuel, God with us right here, right now. Help us, Lord. So we come away from this world that's so crazy and just for a little bit to open your word, to hear what you want to say to us. Lord, I do pray, Lord, help me to stay out of the way. Help us to hear what you want to say to us through your word, your word that's powerful. We love you, Jesus. We love you a lot. We love you, Lord. Trust in you in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen and amen. All right, so John is writing. Um, he is older John. He's elderly John. He's the pastor of this church. He's the apostle John. And this is, the, this is towards the end of... This, this time period of his life. Not the end of his life. He's going to be arrested, exiled out to the island of Patmos, receive the book of Revelation, come back to Ephesus once again. But he's in that window of right before the arrest, and he's writing to them, the church. And it's interesting what he says here. Uh, let's just jump right in here. You hear the, the pastor, you hear the fatherly heart here in verse 18 of chapter 2. He says, children, children. You hear the fatherly heart right there. He says, it is the last hour, and as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, so now many Antichrists, plural, have come. Therefore, we know that it is the last hour, the last days. It's the last hour. Did John believe it was the last days? It was the, 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 it's the end of all things. Well, let's talk about that a little bit. Are we living in the last days today? That's a good question. Did we answer that? We COVID just began we stopped all the teaching and we went straight to the book of Revelation. It was fun. Did some, did some prophecy stuff. And, and uh, we answered that question. Is this the last day? And you already got it, right? The answer is, yes, it is. It began 2,000 years ago. And we're getting closer and closer to his return. You ought to be looking up because our redemption is drawing near. When you see these things begin to take place, the Bible says, lift up your eyes. Man, we're going home one day either in the rapture, in the end times, or in old age. I didn't know I was going to get this old. And I am younger than some of you. Praise God, having, always have older friends in your life. It makes you feel younger. You know, it really does. I love that. But, um, well, here's the thing about end times. Here's the thing about what he's saying here is this is something that's said all along. Jesus spoke about it. Paul spoke about it. Peter spoke about it. the end times. Talked about the coming of the Lord. Jesus said this. You'll recognize this. And well, this is in the this, this is in the book of Matthew. It's in chapter here. There's a hint. Matthew 24 is what? Knocking on the door. 24 is knocking on the door. Thank you for the famous prophet that gave us that little insight there. Matthew 24 is knocking on the door. Why? It's a prophecy passage. That famous prophet that gave us that, who was that? You guys don't know very much, do you? Who was that? Johnny Cash, of course. All right? <laughs> Johnny Cash. So Matthew 24 is not. It doesn't get any better. If you're a visitor, God bless you. It doesn't get any better than this, all right? Would you, okay. <laughs> Matthew 24, listen to what it says. Jesus speaking. He says, um, See that no one, we talk about the end times. He says, see that no one leads you astray. For many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ and will lead many astray. The first characteristics of the end time is that people are going to be led astray. He says, you're going to hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not alarmed for this must take place. For the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, ethnic group against ethnic group. Hello, look at what the time we live in. Borders against borders. 
He says there's going to be famines. In, the, uh, in, in uh, one of the other translations, there's going to be pestilence. Pestilence, epidemic, contagious diseases. There's going to be earthquakes in various places. All these things are the beginning of birth pains. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death. And you'll be hated by all nations for my name's sake. Then many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. And many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. And because of, listen to this, because of lawlessness will, will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. That's pretty heavy right there. The one who endures to the end shall be saved. And he doesn't stop there. But if he did, that would be very concerning. He says, that's what it's going to be like in the last days. Earthquakes and famines and pestilence and against one another. The love, of, the love of many is going to grow cold. And he's painting this very dark picture of the end times. And then he says this. That's going on. And he says this. He says, and this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. The word of God is going to continue to go out. God is continuing to move. Man, the darker it gets, the more the light shines. Now, right now, if I put a candle up on the stage, you wouldn't see it. it you know, you'd, you'd notice it, but not really. Uh, but if I was to make, turn all the lights out in here and put a candle up there, it'd give light to the whole room. You know, let your light so shine before men that they see your good works. And glorify God is who is in heaven. What are we supposed to be doing right now? Jesus, when he talked about the end times, he said, look, all this stuff is going to be going on that we're seeing going on. He says, yeah, but the gospel of the kingdom is going to keep going. What do you want to be focused on? I want to be focused on the good stuff. It's easier, it's easier to focus on the negative. All you got to do is watch, turn on CNN, MSNBC, or Fox News, and you're going to get it all. I mean, can anybody have any happy thoughts on those channels at all? Hello, every time. Everybody hates somebody. You got to hate somebody, you know, and they've got somebody to hate. You know, they hate Trump. They love Trump, whatever. Whatever it is your, your background is or where you're at with all of this, it, all that stuff can become, can I say this to you, Christian? All this stuff can become a distraction. What does God call us to do? The gospel of the kingdom is going to continue to go out. God is still healing people and forgiving people and doing a work. Well, it's not just here. It's not just Jesus said it. Listen to what Paul said in 1 Thessalonians. He said this. He said, now concerning the times and season, brothers, I have no need to, to write to you anything. For you yourself know full aware that the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. While people are saying peace and safety, peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them. Listen to this. As labor pains upon a pregnant woman. Now, you heard me talk about that in the past, because that's kind of the, what to, to look for, that's labor pains. Have you ever watched someone have a baby? Praise God, I'm a man. Man, I wouldn't want to do that. That looks so painful. But the closer you get to the birth, the more intense it gets, the more, the more, I remember my wife saying, I remember my wife saying for the, for the first one, she, it was no medication. She wanted nothing. I took the medication. She wanted nothing. All right. And so, and I remember her at the end, she just said, help me, Jesus, help me, Jesus, because it looked like it hurt. And I felt really sorry for her. But then that baby came, what a joy there was. What a joy there was. And then the kid grew up and hit us up for money and then moved out and all that. And, you know, that, that, that's, another, that's another story, which is was, which was cool. I still love her a lot. But, um, but the thing is, as a pregnant woman, is this, as it gets closer, look what's happening. I mean, that's exactly what we're seeing in our world. It gets real intense and then lets up a little bit. Everybody forgets, everybody goes about their business and then something big happens again. Listen to what he says here. He says, sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman and they will not escape, all right? Freeze frame it there. It's really dark what he's saying here. He says, but you, listen, but you, child of God, you're not in the dark. You're not in darkness, brothers, for the day to surprise you like a thief. For you are all children of light, children of the day. We are not of the night nor of the darkness. So then, don't sleep as others do, but let us be awake and be sober. For those who sleep, they sleep at night. And those who get drunk, they get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, 
Let's be sober. The word sober has, has the idea of a disciplined, trained mind. Have a disciplined, trained mind. Having put on the breastplate of faith and love for the helmet of hope for salvation, that God has not destined us to wrath, but to salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that when we are, whether we are awake or asleep, that we might live for him. Therefore, listen to this. First Thessalonians chapter 5, he says, encourage one another. Build one another up with these words. Do as, as you're doing. So he says here, build each other up. With what? Telling them that uh, it's, he's going to come like a thief at night? No. To remind us, that's not you. That's not your focus. Our focus is on what God is doing. The awesome thing that God is doing. We're not part of the night. We're part of the day. We're not like the world. We are children of God. We are the church. The church. The word church, you know what it means? You do know this, right? Called out ones. Called out of the world. Called into the family of God. And, and, when, and this is just one of the passages. With Paul, I could pick on just about every book. He talks about the coming of the Lord somewhere in it. But let's do one more. Listen to what Peter said. All of them said it. Peter said this in 2 Peter chapter 3, the last book that Peter wrote. Uh, Simon Peter, the apostle of Jesus. Now, this is the second letter that I'm writing to you, beloved. In both of them, I'm stirring you up as a sincere mind in the way of reminder that we should remind, remember the, pre, the, the predictions of the Holy Prophet. I'm, I'm just stirring, all I'm doing is stirring up your mind. I'm reminding you of these things. What did someone say? Christians don't, that was C.S. Lewis that said, Christians don't need to be taught as often as we need to be reminded. This is a reminder right here. He says, I'm reminding you. This is my second time I'm writing to you, he says. He says, I'm doing this as a reminder. It's a reminder about the predictions that the holy prophets in the Old Testament came through the Lord, uh, the Savior, through the apostles. So this flow that came from the, from the prophets to Jesus to, the, uh, to, the, to now through the, through the apostles, and he says, this is what it was. It says, it says knowing this, First of all, that scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing, following their own, their own sinful desires. They will say, hey, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. You, you Christians, you've always been talking about the coming of the Lord. Where's the promise? Where's the promise of his coming? We've been talking about this forever. He says, but they, I love this line right here. For they deliberately overlook the fact that the heavens existed long Long ago, and the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God, and that by means of the, of the world that they existed was diluted with water and perished. The same, the same word, the, heaven, uh, of the, the heavens and earth that exist now are stored up for fire. So he says, look, they, they, I love this line right here. The, the translator says they deliberately overlook. Okay, that word literally means they're dumb on purpose. They're dumb on purpose about God created this earth and he flooded it one time. The Bible says it's with a deluge of water and you know the, the flood story. Thus, do you want to talk about this? Thus, the rainbow, not what you see today and not how it's being used today, but the rainbow. Remember what the rainbow is all about. The rainbow is a promise from God. The promise for God of a new day, a promise of God that what just happened, this destruction is not going to happen that way again. In fact, he's going to make mention of that, that way again. But it is, it is a promise laced with a warning. And then we take it, and I don't want to say this to, to step on anybody's toes, but we take it and we make it something and, and put it back in God's face, something that it was never intended to be. That was to be a blessing, that was to be a blessing, to say, look, here's the promise of a new day with a, with, a, with a warning of don't forget why this is there. Think about what that's about. Again, again, I like what he says here. I don't want to be too offensive right now, but it says they're dumb on purpose. They're dumb on purpose about these things. Now, if you take issue with that, take issue with Peter. When you get to heaven, he'll slap you, all right? So... He says, they're dumb on purpose, he says. The world, he says, but the same, the heavens and the earth that now existed are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and the destruction of the ungodly. And, and let's see, let me, well, let me keep reading. But do not overlook the one fact that the one day is, is a thousand years and a thousand years is a day. The Lord is not slow 
uh, to fulfill his promise as one counts slowness. But he's patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but, but to, that all should, should reach repentance. Why is God waiting? He is waiting. He is waiting. You know, because of his patience. But just understand this. When it is over, it's over. There's no more time to get it right. There's no more time. When, the, when, the, when this is over, it's over. You know, he says this, that the day will come like a thief and then the heavens will pass away with a roar and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved in the earth and its works that are done on it will be exposed. Since then these things are thus dissolved. Listen to this. Again, that's all going to go on. In light of that, listen to what he says. What sort of people ought we to be in our lives of holiness and godliness? We're waiting for and hastening, listen to that word, hastening, come back to that, the coming of the, of the day of the Lord, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved and the heavenly bodies will be melted as they burn. But according to his promise, we are waiting for the new heaven and the new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for these things, be diligent to be found in him without spot or blemish and at peace. These things are going to take place. We're waiting for that day. We're longing for that day. But I like what he says here. The church, early church took this in an interesting direction. It says, it says that, um, verse 12 again, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of the Lord. They read that and they said the hastening, it does mean to speed it up. So, there's a word, it's only used one time in our Bible, and it's, it's in, I think it's in 2 Corinthians, it's, it's the word Maranatha, the word Maranatha. Maranatha means come, come Lord Jesus, come. You know, it's that Maranatha. So the early church took that and said, well, the more we encourage one another to remember the Lord's coming and say Maranatha to one another, Maranatha, that'll hasten the day of the Lord, it'll make it quicker. And so they would greet each other with Maranatha, Maranatha, the Lord's coming back. The Lord's coming back. As a child of God, it should be pretty exciting. Maranatha. Someday we get home. Someday, especially as you get older. When I was younger, you're like, man, give me one more day, Lord. There's still so much to do. As you get older, it's like, wow, this body hurts. I can't wait to get a new body. I can't wait for that day to finally see him face to face. You know, and I've said this to you guys a lot. What if? What if today was our last day? What if this was our last month? What if this is our last year? What, what would, we, would we do something different? But then, then what are we waiting for? Lord, help us in that. But I, I think it's interesting as you go through, and we could spend a lot of time here, and we spend, we spend some time here, is this. As you look through every, every bit of the, of the New Testament, with Jesus, the apostles, John is doing it here, they all had this, this excitement about the coming of the Lord. There was something that is in them that stirred up. Now, um, are we going to say that we're going to set dates and all that? No, we're not. And there's good people that believe, I have a pastor friend that, that believes Jesus cannot come back right now because there's still some things that need to happen, all right? I love picking on him, teasing him, and telling him that Jesus is not coming back for him, but he's coming back for us because he is a hairy tick, all right? So he's not, he's just a friend and I like messing with him. But, but I want you to listen to this and then I'll move, on, I'll move on to what John's saying here is this. Here's where Harry, how he wants us to live. Did John believe it was the last days? He said, we know it's the last days. Okay, he wants us to live every day with, with the imminent return of Jesus. In other words, there really is nothing that needs to happen. Jesus could come back right now. And I, we could give scripture after scripture. First, first Corinthians 17, uh, first, seven, first Corinthians 17, see if you can find that in your Bible. First Corinthians 1, 7. Okay, it says this. It says, waiting eagerly, for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. Philippians 3 says, For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Thessalonians 1 says, We are waiting for the Son from heaven. 1, 1 Timothy 6, he says, That you keep the commandments without spot or reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Titus 2 says, Looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Well, there's a lot of James here and, and uh, Revelation 3. Um, Jesus says, I'm coming quickly. And the Spirit and the bride says, come. Let those who hear say, yes, come, Lord, come. All, 
Uh, he who testifies these things, yes, says, I am coming quickly. And we say, yes, amen, come Lord Jesus. He is coming quickly. Man, it could be today. Sh should we live that way? Absolutely. We should live every day like today's the day. Lord, give us, I do pray this. You've probably heard me pray this. Lord, Lord, come quickly, but Lord, give us one more day. There's still so much to do. There's still so many that don't know. I have a brother that doesn't know Jesus, and I want him to know Jesus. He's come a long ways. He's in such a better place now, but he's not there yet. Don't come yet, Lord. I still have people I love that I want to know you. I have people that I love that are really hurting, that need you. Jesus, give us one more day. One more day. There's still so much to do. Well, when John is writing here, John is saying, little children, this is the last hour, and you've heard that the Antichrist is coming. So many Antichrists have come. Therefore, we know it is the last hour. He lived in anticipation of this. And one of the things for him was, was the Antichrist, anti, anti, something that's opposed or replaced the Christ. It's those Antichrists. Now, he's talking about uh, and the spirit of Antichrist. How do we know that? Because he defines it a little bit later in chapter 4, because he talks about this a lot through the rest of his letter. He says in, in, verse, in verse 3, And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist. The spirit of the Antichrist is those that Antichrist, again, remember that word, it means something that's opposed to God, opposed to Christ. That spirit of the Antichrist is those that are denying Christ, are denying Christ. Now, we can confuse that because in the book of Revelation, several places, there's whole chapters dedicated to an individual that is known as the Antichrist. He is the Antichrist. Here he's talking about Antichrist, plural, right? So there is the Antichrist. You know, the Bible speaks about two leaders that are going to come, the book of Revelation, two leaders, a political leader and a religious leader. So the religious leader will cause everyone to come and worship the, the political leader. And so that's coming. Are they alive today? I don't know. Can I tell you this? I thought for a while, and I had you guys saying it, oh, horrible pastor. I thought it might have been, might have been Al Gore. You know, he created the internet, you know. And then Gorbachev came on the scene. Remember Gorbachev? Some of you have been around. And Gorbachev had that big birthmark right here. Remember that? Big old spot right there. And the Bible says he's going to have a fatal head wound. I go, oh, that looks like this dude has a fatal head wound right there. That's Gorbachev. I quit doing that a long time ago because that's dumb. I'm not looking for the Antichrist. I'm looking for Jesus. I'm looking for Jesus. I don't, amen to that. Amen to that. Good. Yes, amen. And the thing is this, it's not, it's all this ugly stuff is going on. And, and Christians, we focus on that way too much. There's good stuff going on. God is doing a work. God is changing the lives of people. Man, look at the good stuff that God is doing. Don't look at the negative. Because you look at the negative, you're going to get stuck there. And John is saying, look, there is the negative. There is those. And in fact, he says, he says we know, he says, uh, they went out from us, and they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us, but they went out, that they might become plain that they were not of us. But you have been anointed by the Holy One, and all uh, you all have knowledge. I write these things. So they laughed, and they... It, they left showing that they really weren't with us anyways. He says, I write to you, not because you do not know the truth, but because you do know it. And because no lie is of the truth. Who is a liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist. Who has denied the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. Verse 24. It says, let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. If, you, if what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you will abide in the Son and, the, and in the Father. And this is the promise that He has made, is eternal life. I write these things to you about those who are trying to deceive you. Well, he says, well, the, the, let me just keep reading this. The anointing that, that you receive from Him abides in you, and you have no need that anyone should teach you, but as your anointing teaches you about everything, and it's true, and there's no lie. Just as it has taught you, abide in Him. So what's he saying here? He says, look, I don't need to teach you any of these things about the Antichrist and all that. You have the Spirit of God dwelling in you. You know what's right and what's wrong. You just got to slow down. 
I think that's true of today. You just got to slow down. In fact, he's going to say in, uh, in verse 1 of chapter 4, he says, don't believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see if they're of God. Test all things. Hold fast that which is good, it says in 1 Thessalonians. So what are we supposed to be doing? Well, check it out. Check it out. What is that person saying? Is it true? Is it true? We say this little saying to you, if it's, if it's, if it's new, it's not true. And if it's true, it's not new. It's a good little saying right there. It's not some new doctrine. I have this new doctrine. Right? The new doctrine is, and whatever it is, you can run from that. You know, you guys, listen, we have, are you a child of God? Are you born again of the Spirit of God? You have the Spirit of God dwelling in you. So here's the deal, is that slow things down. When you hear things from this pastor or some leader or somebody on the radio or someone in, in the pulpit or sp- they say they're speaking for God, slow it down. Are what they saying lining up with what God has already given us in his word? If it contradicts what God has said, then I'm going to contradict what they said because God has given us his word. You know, this is important that we test all things, hold fast that which is good. We need to test those things. But also I lean on this a lot is what is God showing you? What is God showing you? Slow it down. Do you really know God? Are you really seeking Him? What is God showing you? I have a super strong opinion. I think you should be doing certain things, and I will tell you what you should be doing. And if you don't do it, well, I'll try to be quiet, but I'll think you're dumb. All right? You should, do, you should, get, you should be doing a lot of stuff for God. You know? And then I'll catch myself doing that. That's just my personal. I've always been like that. I've been a pusher. You know, Come on, let's do this thing. We can make a difference. Come on, let's go make a difference. And I catch myself doing that, and I have to stop and say, wait a minute, wait, 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 wait. Stop listening to me right now. What is God telling you? Because I don't want to get in the way. What is God showing you to do? Well, I'm not sure. Okay, well, then do this, 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 I got to go do this, you know. But here's the thing is that you have a relationship with God. You know, the, uh, this is one of the precious things that we believe as followers of Jesus is that the ground at the crosses is, is level. We all got access to God, you know. You don't, you don't need, we need each other, but you don't need someone to tell you what to do. You just said that. What you need to do is be listening to what God's telling you to do. Well, I'm not sure what God's telling me to do. That's why he gave us his word. That's why he gave us some instruction. That's why he gave us, listen, that's why he gave us prayer. Abba, Father, Dad, help me here. And the more you pray, here's here's a radical truth. The more you pray and the more you draw near to God, the more he draws near to you. And the more you pray, the more you start hearing what his prompting is and what he's doing. The closer you get to God, the closer he gets to you. You know, this is important because so many times we don't pray. Oh, I guess I could just pray about it. I don't have anything else to do. I'll just pray about it. No, that's the first thing you should do. And that's the thing you ought to do in the midst of your trials. And that's the thing you ought to do as you're going through it. You ought to be talking to God. God, help me. Help me get through this. Help me to know how to deal with this thing. But it's hard sometimes. Isn't it? Because God tells me to do stuff I don't want to do sometimes. In other words, he tells me to like people I don't want to like. Be nice to people. Go be nice to that person. Well, I don't want to be nice to that person. I don't like that person. I'm having a hard time with that person. Be nice. And I hear that, that still small voice. Be nice. Be nice. It's a still small voice, but I think sometimes it's my wife too. So I hear her right now. Be nice. Be nice. I'm trying. I'm trying. Leave me alone. I don't like that person. Do you have people you don't like? All right. Yeah, you do. We all do. Is it me? I'm really sensitive about that. Don't hurt my feelings, all right? So, but no, here the thing is this, is that what is he telling them there? Well, I love this in the middle of this. He's telling them, you know, it's there, there, there is false spirits out there. There's things that will lead you astray. You need to abide in God and all that. And in the middle of this, and I circled it, highlighted, it jumps off the page in my Bible. He says, he, he's given you eternal life. I love that. This is what he's given you. He's given you eternal life. In that, you now have someone to walk you through this life's journey. He is the Holy Spirit the paracletus, the one that comes alongside to help. He's the one that helps us. He's the one when the Spirit is saying to to be nice, He's the one that shows us how to do it. And it's amazing that that the closer we get to God, the closer He gets to us and the more He guides our life. It sounds like so simple, but it's something that we miss because it's so much easier. I like 
I like the broad road, the one that leads to destruction. Everybody's going down that one. Man, there's, a, there's beer taps all along the way and, and whiskey bars and strip clubs and all that. You know, that's where that one goes. The narrow way is difficult sometimes. It's the narrow way is, is difficult. He said it. It's difficult, that narrow way. But Lord, take us down that narrow way because that's where the joy is. That's where the fulfillment is. Oh, here's, that's where the hangovers are. Don't hang out. You know, that's where the guilt doesn't hang out. In that narrow road, that's where fulfillment happens. Lord, help us in this. Christian, we're on that narrow road. And there's a lot of static in this world to take us in different directions. And all this stuff is going on in the world. Turn that stuff off. I have to tell myself this. I want to watch Fox News. I want to watch MSNBC and, and CNN. I want to watch this stuff so I can get mad at what's going on. You know, those idiots, look what they're doing. They're destroying the world, you know. And the Lord is saying, yeah, the further you get, check this out. The further you get into that, the further you get away from him. Instead, what has he called us to? Look at the good stuff. Look what God's doing. Look at the miracles around us. And no matter how hard it gets, there's joy in this journey. When it's difficult and when it's hard, he's in the midst. But you've got to look for him. You got to look for him. You got to die to yourself and die to that stuff and let him be the one. Hmm, Pastor, that sounds good, but it's hard. Yeah, sometimes it is. That's why. That's why we need each other. That's why we need the church, the called out ones, called into the family. That's why we need to be doing these things together because it is hard. He's called us to hard things. So, what are we going to do? I don't know. I'm going to go turn on the news and see if I missed anything. Okay? <laughs> yeah, really? Well, I don't know. I'm not going to say put your head in the sand or any of that. And I'll still watch enough just to keep my blood pressure high and I have to take pills for it. All right? But I do know this. When we're finally home, and we're going home soon, when we're finally home, we'll realize how much of that stuff is just a huge distraction to what God was calling us to do. A huge distraction. Oh, let's, while we're here and we're getting old, we're getting old. I'm getting ready to turn 60. That's young for some of you. Look at that. Don't you wish you were 60 again? Ha! All right. So I'm getting ready to turn 60. And so that's, that just sucks. All right. Okay. And so in that, in that, I look back and, and, uh, and the things that we've done for Christ are the things that have made an impact in my life, in our world. The things that we've done, well, not for the, not the stupid things, not the political things and all that. Maybe you're called to politics, all right? Do it well, do it well. Don't get caught up in the minutia of all the stupid stuff, all right? But hmm. I don't know. I read this and just say, okay, Lord, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. Now little children abide in him so that when he appears, we have confidence and will not shriek from him in shame and in his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you may be sure that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. Lord, help us. And Lord, we pray, Lord, that you would help us to be a people that would walk in righteousness. To do the right things, Lord. To not play church and not be religious just so that we can feel better about who we are. Lord, let that die in each one of us. But Lord, help us to be a people that really care about those around us. That Lord, I pray, Lord, that this would never be a place of judgment. That Lord, that we would judge one another in a critical and nasty way. Lord, that the church would never be that. Lord, make this, Lord, make this a safe place for people to come and hear about you. Lord, help us in this, Lord. It's so easy to get off track. We know there's distractions out there. We know there's antichrist spirits out there. We know there's distractions, Lord. But help us not to curse the darkness, but to turn on the light. Help us in that, Lord. And I pray for each person in this room. Lord, you know each one. You know where they're at with you. And do you know for sure that you're his? This is where the journey begins. Not being religious. Mm -mm. It's a relationship with God that created you. 
Jesus, come into my life. Forgive me of my sins. That's where it starts, right there. Maybe you need to say this again. Maybe you need to reiterate it in your heart. Lord, come into my life. Help me to follow you. Lord, I repent of my sins. I turn from my sins and I turn to you. Help me to sin no more. You put it in your own words. He's here and he loves you a lot. And Lord, thank you for this church, a place that we can come together to love each other and to, to encourage each other on this journey. Help us in this, Lord. We need you. We trust in you. Thank you, Jesus. Let's all stand together.